I was in Michigan State College when they bombed Pearl Harbor. And I remember somebody came in and said, they bombed Pearl Harbor. And I said, I don't even know where Pearl Harbor is. Nobody else seemed to. So the next morning at 8 o'clock, I was in a big conference hall. And the older professor looked up at all of us and he said, ladies and gentlemen, boy, will your lives change. And boy, was he right. Uh, anyhow, I was in the uh, infantry ROTC, and my father had been a pilot in World War I over in France, and he was a fighter pilot. And also, I, when I later was going through BASIC, they had mentioned something about night fighters. Well, I didn't even think of the night. All I thought of was the fighters. So there I went into night fighters. But anyhow, uh, I went out to California, went all through flying school out there, and I started saying and moved right on up to the coast. And then after I graduated, I flew B-25s up at Sacramento for a short time. And then I went down to Luke Field at, at uh, Gila Bend, and that's where I had uh, training on firing and we fired at the targets that were towed behind an airplane, and we also fired air to ground. So it was air to air and air to ground. Shortly thereafter, I went to um, Orlando, Florida, and they were just activating the night fighter squadrons that they were going to send all over the world. <clears throat> so anyhow, there were three phases. The first phase was pretty much instrument flying. In fact, we had some uh, fellows that had been over in, in, uh, Afri in uh, Europe that were day fighters, but they didn't know how to fly instruments, and so they came back, wanted to get into it, so they had to get the instrument training. Well, one day I was in a mess hall when one of the officers came up to me and said, you don't have to go to the flight line this morning, he says, because we're going to make you an instrument instructor. I said, what? Well, I guess I was further along flying instrument training than some of the other guys, and they thought I'd be good at that. So anyhow, I, I got the, ins the instruction to be a night fighter, I mean an instrument pilot trainer. And uh, shortly thereafter, I, we were in Orlando. We had the three phases at Orlando, Kissimmee, and Denellen. And uh, we were there about six months, and then they had put me in for first lieutenant back then. But then they moved all of us out to California, and I flew an A-20 out there from Orlando. And when I uh, got out there, I was at Salinas, California, and quite a few of the people were at Fresno. So uh, I taught instruments for a short time. And I, I didn't want to really stay in the States. I was young and sort of stupid, like a lot of us were. And so I wanted to get overseas. So anyhow, they allowed me to get out of the teaching instrument flying. And I, I was hooked up with a, with a uh, radar operator. And this was a fellow that it was, had gone through navigation school, but he didn't make it as a navigator. And so then they sent him to radar school. So he washed out his navigator and became a radar operator. Well, anyhow, one night we were flying over the mountains, uh, cross country, and he couldn't use his radar. He had to do it by navigation. Well, as we're flying over the mountains, he told me the peaks were only so high, so high. And it was that night, and I sort of didn't quite believe him. So I kept easing up a little bit. And finally, he said he's lost. And I said, thanks. So anyhow, we ended up landing down around Palm Springs. Well, those mountains are over 10,000 feet high. And if I had listened to him, I would have crashed right in the mountains. So anyhow, when we got back to Fresno, I didn't want to go overseas with him. So I got a, a different operator, radar operator. And then we went through the various transitions. And then I, uh, we, the two of us were sent over to New Guinea. They flew us over to uh, Port Moresby, 
And then we joined a squadron, a night fighter squadron, in Nadzeb, uh, New Guinea. At, uh, and I was in the jungle, but then they had just, the Navy had just uh, captured a coral island off of New Guinea. It was Aoi, called Aoi, and uh, we were sent down there. And the, the way that strip was built, we have the CBs, the construction battalion of the Navy. They go in with dozers and all their equipment. They knock down all the palm trees and scrape off all the, and then the strip is on coral. And the coral would disintegrate, so they also, throughout the time we're there, they have a water, a truck with a water tank on it. So they got to keep watering it so the coral doesn't uh, fall apart. We had these black widows, they were brand new, they were from uh, Northrop out in California. And then we had some sent to our squadron down in Australia. They were in crates and they took uh, the planes and put them together down there, our mechanics. So the first P-61 I ever saw was up in Aoi at this little island. And one day, my radar operator and a fellow who worked on radar sets on the ground, he, he wasn't a flying man, we took an ad, P-60 went up, my first flight, and uh, they were going to check the radar set in the back of the airplane. So we, uh, we went up and we're flying around. And finally, I called over the intercom and I said, we got a problem. Our hydraulic system's out. Well, your hydraulic system operates your wheels and your flaps and different things in the airplane. So uh, I had learned all the backup procedures on the airplane, which a pilot has to do before they fly a plane they've never been in before. And so uh, we had what it was called a wobble pump. And you would pump this to a small cell, um, uh, container, and that would give you enough hydraulic pressure that I could lower the flaps and the wheels. So I lowered the flaps and the wheels to come in for a landing. Of course, I had to make sure I got in on that strip the first time because you couldn't pull everything up to go around. So you had to make sure you got in. So anyhow, uh, uh, I came in on the strip, put it down, but then I didn't have anything left for the brakes. But there's also a uh, backup where you can take and pull a little lever down here where uh, it actuates air, so the air to the brakes. So I was right about to run out of the strip. It's not really long. It's a little longer than a, than a Navy's flies off their carriers. But anyhow, I was near the end of it, and I pulled this, and the air came on, and the brakes really stopped. In fact, it stopped so good that it blew one of the tires on the front. So fortunately, we were right near, near our squadron of operations, so they just pulled it off and put a new tire on. But I figure that's a lot better than putting it in the drink. Well, anyhow, uh, we, we kept moving along New Guinea on some islands and some on the shore. And there was another uh, night fire squadron. We'd see that seemed to jump each other. And we went all through New Guinea. Now, we never took a lot of uh, land or anything like that. What we did, we, we with the day fighters and the night fighters, we had neutralized the area and we kept pushing the Japs back. And we finally got all the way to the end near across from Biak. And then we went up on a landing in the Philippines. And we got up there two days after the landing. And man, I'll tell you, the Japanese threw everything they had at us. It was really a rough deal for the Navy and ourselves. In fact, they kept us bombed so much on the strip, we couldn't hardly get off. And I remember one night, we were in and out of the foxholes all night long. And after we did break and then we had breakfast, we went back to our tent. And it was early in the morning. Well, a Tony somehow had got in over our area without uh, the alert coming on. And I was laying in the tent and my radar operator was laying on the other side of the tent. And uh, uh, 
Two 500-pound explosives were dropped in our area, and it killed 37 of our people. And one thing it killed was my radar operator. It blew him dead in the mosquito netting. And I was on the other side, and fortunately, I had my leather jacket hung up at the end of the mosquito netting, and it had so much shrapnel through it that it looked like rats had eaten it, and so I couldn't use it anymore. But anyhow, it stopped a lot from hitting me. I got some shrapnel, but it blew out the air mattress from underneath me, and I had three holes in the tent about this size above me. So I was very fortunate there. So then I ended up getting another radar operator, and uh, we, uh, I want to mention that on, uh, when we'd take off, we never used any lights for takeoff or landing. They'd put up a couple of flare pots at the end of the strip, and we'd line up, and that's how we'd take off. And the reason we didn't use lights is because the Japanese seeing a plane coming in or taking off, you're vulnerable, and they could come down and shoot us down. But then we did the same thing at their aerodromes. So uh, I, we moved on up into Luzon, and we were at a place called San Marcelino. And at San Marcelino, it's in a valley, and it mountains around. And we, when we would take off at night, we'd go from the tower frequency over to the ground radar. And the ground radar, would vector us out through a pass up through the mountains. And I'm glad that they were very accurate because I didn't want to fly into the mountains. Anyhow, we flew up and then we'd do what we had to do. Then later on, we went from there in Luzon over to Clark Field when they first deactivated it. And we were some of the first in the Clark Field. And uh, I remember we had one, one uh, officer who was a captain, and he was, he was a non-flying officer. But for some reason, he didn't get along with the flying officers as well as he could have. So he had to go over to the Clark Field, and so I had the mission to fly him over there. So when I'm flying him over there, I, I, uh, over the mounds, I took and right, reached down, and I feathered the right engine. And of course, it stopped, the blade stopped like this. So uh, I, I didn't act as unconcerned as anything, and I'm flying. I get near Clark, and I unfeather it and go down and land. After we landed, he said, say, did you know that that one engine stopped? And I turned around, and I said, no, did it? <laughs> but anyhow, I bet he really had a conniption. But uh, we were at Clark Field for quite a while. And uh, when we were in the Philippines, I'll tell you, the Japanese sure didn't want us back, back there, but Douglas MacArthur, we called him Dugout Doug, he said, we shall return, and boy, did we return. But uh, the Navy really had a fight, and we did too, and there's, there was a lot of action in the air. We also, uh, in order to come in and land, because if somebody would even open up a pop gun, everybody by shooting, so we had what we called a lover's lane. We'd go on up around Samar, which is an island above us, and we'd come in a certain way and come in to land, and they're not supposed to shoot at you. And that was called a lover's lane. But I know one day a P-38 was coming in with one engine out, and unfortunately our guy shot the other engine out. So I tell you, everybody over there were a little trigger happy because there was so much happening. So it was, it was quite an experience going back to the Philippines. And then shortly after, uh, our squadron kept moving up. But uh, I had the 95 missions, so I was sent back home. And, and I came back by boat. It took me, I think, 21, 22 days to get from Manila. Pulled into San Francisco Harbor. And boy, those Golden Gate bridges were beautiful. They really look good. And uh, we're pulled in the dock, and they're talking on the newspaper about atomic bomb. Well, that's the first we ever heard of it. Of course, that had just happened. And then shortly thereafter, the war was over. But I'll tell you, that saved a lot of lives 
Because even though it, it killed them at the two bombs that were dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, whatever the other one is, but anyhow, a lot of our guys were going to move into the Philippines, and then a lot of people from Europe, it had been completed, the war there, and they were coming over to invade Japan. And I'll tell you, the Japanese don't want to give up. They didn't, through the war, you didn't hear about a lot of prisoners over there because there weren't any prisoners. It was kill or be killed. So it was, it was tough, and, and going through New Guinea was a real experience. So anyhow, that's my story so far. When they dropped it, of course, I had just hit San Francisco back here. Now, a lot of people maybe are against it, but I'll tell you, Harry Truman did the right thing. Even though a number of people were killed with that bomb, uh, those atomic bombs, I'll tell you, a lot more would have been killed both on our side and the Japanese because they didn't want to give in and we didn't want to give in. And it was a tough war over there. And that really put an end to it. And I think it saved an awful lot of lives. So I, I was, I'm for it. Some people might be against it, but I'll tell you, it was the right thing in my, in my opinion. Well, the P-61 that we flew, it was a, called a night fighter. It was built by Northrop, and it was a wonderful airplane. It was very maneuverable. It had spoilers that came up out of the wings that would allow you to turn really sharp. And uh, for a while, I went over to the Plow Islands with some other night fighters, and there were Marines that had been there, and they wanted them to see some action over in the Philippines. So we exchanged with them. And so we went to uh, Peleliu. Well, there was Peleliu in, in Angor in uh, Babelthrop. But anyhow, in the Plow Islands, there, uh, we used to go up in dogfight with the uh, Marines. They fl were flying F-4Us. And I'll tell you, even though I, my, I was a twin-engine airplane and theirs were single, I could cut the one engine and with those spoilers, I could really turn inside of them. And, and we really had a sort of fun dogfighting with them. And I'll, I'll never forget the Plum Islands. They had little gnats there that were so small, they could get through your mosquito netting. And of course, there was a lot of land crabs there. And they had a lot of big rats and everything else. And I'll tell you, that was a tough battle for the Army and the Marines when they went in there and took that island those islands. The uh, Army went into Angor, and the Marines went into Peleliu. And then later, the Army uh, came over and helped the Marines on Peleliu. So uh, it's, it's not a place I'd like to retire at. <laughs> First of all, it had three man crew. It had a pilot up in front, it had a gunner right behind that sat in the seat up and the pilot was down here. And in the back was a radar operator with a radar set. And um, the remote control turret could be fired by the pilot pushing on the wheel, or it could be fired by the radar, I mean the gunner, or if it went around to the back, the radar operator could fire it. It was a a turret just like they had on the B-29s. And then uh, for armament, we had four 50 caliber machine guns in this turret, and each round, each uh, gun had 500 rounds of, of ammunition. And then we also had four 20 millimeter cannons that were in the fuselage, and uh, they had 200 rounds for each gun. So with, a, with the uh, 20 millimeter cannons and the, and, the, and the four caliber machine guns, it really had a lot of firepower. And I could, and strafing, which I was sent out on some strafing missions sometimes, uh, I could take and fire the uh, 
cannons and the, and the machine guns with this finger and this thumb on the wheel if I, we were strafing. So it really, it really was a powerful airplane. It, uh, it was really developed for night fighters, and I think they built over 400 of them. Uh, now, some of the night fighters that went over to the, Europe, they, they, they were in boat fighters. And the boat fighters were, is that's a plastic plane? I mean, uh, uh, made of wood. Anyhow, it was converted for night fighters. But I sure loved the P-61. We had a few problems with it. One night, uh, I was taking off in Tacloban in the Philippines at, in the middle of the night. And uh, I had an engine blow up on takeoff right over the water. I didn't have altitude, I didn't have flying speed, and so I ended up in the water. And uh, all I know is that when I got in the water, a normal ditching, your tail hits and then your nose hits, and the nose when it hits is a real whop. But so anyhow, all I knew I was in the water, so I undid my safety belt. Then when the nose hit, I didn't have to open the canopy above me. My head took it right out. So I, I, was, I had strapped to me a parachute and also a one-man life raft. And unfortunately, our May West, West that we had on, they didn't work too well because they had those little CO2 cartridges like you could make soda water with years ago. And they were sort of rusty and it didn't work. So our May West weren't worth a darn. But anyhow, I was going down for about the last time when I pulled the pin on the life raft and it inflated and it's the prettiest sound I've ever heard. And up it came and so I got in my life in the life raft and then uh, uh, I saved my gunner. He had held up my radar operator for a while, but then he, he couldn't swim. But anyhow, my gunner, I got him in there. So the two of us were in this little life raft in the middle of the night, and uh, they were unloading uh, ships out in the harbor, and they and they coming into the land and loading supplies. And one of the we heard one of the boats coming near us, so we yelled out in the dark. Well, anyhow, they picked us up, and they, take, they took us into the airstrip. And that was my first experience of putting a plane in the water. I, then I, when I think about the captain that put the one in the, in the uh, Hudson, well, he did a great job. Of course, I, this was at night, and it, what must have happened is when my left engine blew up, it threw me over into my right engine, which was going. So when I went in, that must have come up just about right. So I must have gone in for about a normal ditching. But it was black, and I couldn't really tell. Well, the pilot, the gunner sat behind him in the back of the plane. That's where the radar operator was. Now, he could, he could send the information up to us. One night, I might mention, I was scrambled. We used to have what we called IFF. Uh, that was identification in a plane that you, you know you're, you're a friend and not a foe. So one night, the, the uh, radar on the ground found this airplane that was coming in with, with uh, it looked like an enemy. So I was scrambled to go out and get this airplane. So the ground control radar vectored me in the general area. And then my radar operator in the back, he picked up the plane. And I was coming in balls out with my throttles way up. And I was closing on this airplane so fast that I thought, boy, I'm almost going to have to drop my wheels and flaps so I don't overshoot. Anyhow, I pulled up alongside, and it was dark, but we had to learn silhouettes and different planes, what they looked like and that. Anyhow, it turned out to be a PBY-5 of the Navy. And they would go out over enemy territory scouting things, and they had IFF 
and they, tur they turned it off over the enemy territory because the Jap a Japanese got so they could trigger the IFF in our planes. So they turned it off, and then when they came back in our area, they had to turn it on. Well, this PBY-5 uh, didn't want to, uh, forgot to turn their IFF on. And I, fortunately, because it was flying so slow, that, that was a good indication for me, too. It was one of the flying boats. But anyhow, I pulled up alongside, and I took and fired a, a burst of machine gun fire across the front of the, across this bow. And of course, every, every uh, so many bullets, it's a tracer, so they could see it. Well, I'll tell you, every light in that airplane came on, and so did their IFF. And I thought, boy, you're lucky, because I didn't want to shoot down one of our own airplanes. Well, I remember one time, when I was up in Luzon, the, uh, the army and the Japanese had formed the line that they weren't moving too much. And over on the other side of the uh, island, there, they knew there was a bunch of Japanese there. And so I, I left in, in, the, in the night, flew over, came in right at daybreak, and came in on the deck and then I saw the place, and then I ended up shooting this place all apart. In fact, I, got, I almost got trigger happy they should have shot me down. But anyhow, I did the job on it. And then we used to uh, sometimes get up early in the morning, and it'd be daylight up above, it'd be dark here, and we'd be looking for the Japanese to come in so we could dive down on them. And uh, we shot a few planes down. Uh, I think they got a lot more planes over in Europe because there was more planes to shoot. But they had a Betty bomber that would come over, and, and they had the Zeros and this Tony. But, uh, and then another thing we used to do is uh, <coughs> near the end of the war, they had the kamikaze pilots. And we had the uh, Navy that had the PT boats. And the PT boats would go out at night, you know, the different places that they were gonna attack. <clears throat> but then as they were coming back in daylight, then the kamikaze pilots would go after them. So then we ended up going out, picking up our own PT boats, and we did cover for them so that the uh, kamikazes wouldn't get them. Of course, they came in and we'd have to shoot them down. But that's, that's another mission we did. We had a number of missions that we did overseas. Um, but, of course, most of it was all at night or early in the morning. And, uh, like I said, it was, it was a, oh, there's one time we couldn't get off of uh, Tacloban because Japanese were bombing it all the time. And so our guys south of, uh, south of uh, this was on Tacloban and, and, and Lady. So south on Lady, our army had just captured a small grass strip. And the grass was so high, your props just about cut it. And it wasn't exactly too long. But they decided, well, we'll put a couple of planes down there and maybe we can get off in the dark. And then as they come in, the bomb, the, the strip up ahead, and that, that had landing mat on it, steel landing mat. So anyhow, I know that uh, the long time uh, guns, boy, when they'd fire, you'd be laying there on your cot, and you'd almost do a slow roll in it. But uh, we got in the airplane in the dark, uh, held the brakes on, gave it full throttle, and we aim for the parking lights of a Jeep at the other end of the strip. And then you'd go up over it. Well, then there were trees on each side and everything. I'll tell you today, if they gave me a million dollars to do that, I wouldn't even think of doing it. But back in those days, if you were told to do something, you did it. But I, I sure remember that deal. So we used that strip a couple times.
some of the islands that, that they, we captured away from them, there would be dead Japs. And also in the Plow Islands, uh, in Peleliu, there were dead Japs all over the place. But uh, like I said, uh, we didn't take any enemies. I mean, we didn't take any money to uh, put them in a concentration camp. And they didn't take any of ours, so it was killed or be killed. It was a different war over there. And uh, going through New Guinea, it's, uh, <laughs> it's sure different. Uh, I know one time when I was on uh, one of the islands, I forgot if it was Awe or Wadki, but there was a uh, squadron there a maintenance squadron that they rebuild engines and that in airplanes. And they had some um, B-25s where they had in the repair of the plane. So they didn't have a they didn't have a pilot to go up and check it after it was repaired. And of course those fellows didn't see any action. So one day they knew that we had flown those airplanes. So they came down and got us to go up and, and test them. So anyhow, the guys would love to go up, one of, the, one of their people, to see, uh, see what it was like. Uh, and actually what they did, they had some guns and they put some ammunition in them. <laughs> and they, this way they could write back and say they saw action. So I think I made about five missions there that I couldn't count because they were on, weren't authorized. But anyhow, we flew off this island, and we flew over to the mainland of New Guinea, and there were a bunch of Japanese over there. And I know one time I was flying low, and there were a bunch of them sit, uh, sitting up in a knoll there. And uh, so I, we went, these guys, they wanted a little action, so we gave them a little action, and then tucked the planes back. But... Uh, I'll tell you, it was, it was different. And the one way I'll tell you how we used to do our laundry, I think this is interesting. We didn't have a laundry per se, but what we had, we'd take a tent rope and we'd take it through our sleeves of our shirts and through our pants, and we'd take it, hang it out over in the salt water. And the waves would come in and wash against these, these clothes. Then what we would do, take it off the tent, uh, tent rope, take it back and put it on the tent. Usually we had uh, sun and rain right on the equator there all the time. So we put it on the tent, and then, and then later on it would rain, wash out the salt water, and then the sun would come and dry our clothes. So that was our washing machine. So I thought that was different. <laughs> but we kept moving up. In fact, we were always in the front lines, and the beer rations never caught up with us because they were always back. But now, uh, one thing is for all our missions, each mission that we got, they gave us two ounces of whiskey. I guess they thought we needed it. <laughs> but anyhow, I, uh, I would save till I got a bottle of it, and I could sell it for $45. But I want you to know, I didn't sell it. I used it. <laughs> but anyhow, so that's probably the reason I got as many missions as I did. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you, it was a different type of war over in the Pacific than it was over in Europe. And of course, in the central part of the Pacific, the islands uh, with the Marines going in and everything. But uh, we got back to the Philippines and uh, it was rough going when we first got there. We were in the 421st, and they had some that were 418th and different ones. Now, the 421st is still in existence in the Air Force today. It's out at Hill Air Force Base, and they're flying uh, uh, the, uh, what is it, the uh, 61 or, well, anyhow. It's, it's, it's a single engine, but it, it can carry three 500-pound bombs under one wing and 300 the other wing. 
So we were out there meeting with some of the current 421 pilots, and they, they, they treated us royally because we had been some of the forerunners of their squadron, and they had in their ready room, they had it around the top, they had the planes they, they've shot down, and they had the planes we shot down, and it was fun being with them. Now you ask about our our squadron. Well, it was it was made up of different uh, enlisted men. We had some in armament, armament. They would load and take care of our guns. Then we had radar people that would work help on the radar sets. Of course, we had the mechanics who were real good. They were the ones that took care of the airplanes, the engines, and everything else, and. Uh, we had a couple uh, officers, ground, con ground officers, that were in intelligence that would give us information in that, what to do or not to do. And so, and then they had uh, like this one captain that I was flying over the mountains with. He was in the, in the uh, headquarters taking care of records and so forth. But uh, the whole squadron got along good. And uh, most of the pilots were pretty much stuck together. And of course, uh, I'll tell you, it was, a, it was a, an experience that I'll never forget. When the weather was bad and the day fighters were going to go on a mission and couldn't go, we went. Because then later on they called us all weather pilots instead of night fighter. But it was originally night fighter. And so, uh, we, we had, of course, we had the instrument training, but I tell you, you go in some of that weather and you're bouncing all over and the water's coming through the windows even though they're, even though they're shut. But it, 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 was a, it was a thrill, some of them. <laughs> but, and another thing is, we'd be out on some of these missions quite a ways and come back and we'd almost be low on fuel. Well, you didn't have any other airports around that you could land on. So we had to get into our base. And then also being on the equator there, a lot of times the clouds would build way up, but you still had to get in. But fortunately we had radar. And you know, we could go along the coastline with a, I had a little scope in the front that my radar operator would operate for me. And I could see, you know, the coastline, how you could go along. And uh, we've had times where our radio went out, but we were brought back by uh, radar. And then we had times our radar went out, but the uh, air, I mean, the listening over your headphones and the ground control would bring you back. But anyhow, coming back, sometimes with the low fuel, and there, maybe there were big clouds built up over your base, it didn't make any difference, you had to go in it's the only place, you couldn't go another place because it was too many miles away. I, I, when I heard about fighters, I wanted to get in because my dad had been in World War I, and I never even considered the night, but that's what I got into. In the same time, my father went back in the service, and he, he, he was given a, 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 a captain's commission when he went back in, and uh, he hadn't been in the reserve, but he wanted to go. My brother, he flew all kinds of airplanes. Uh, he, uh, he even flew the Jetstar, which is made by Lockheed with two uh, engines in the fuselage in the back. And he was over in, uh, oh, he was in Korea and Vietnam, and he was in Japan. And then what later. Oh, he flew a number of planes. Uh, like I said, he flew this Jetstar. And he'd have to tell you, but I know there's a lot of different airplanes he flew. So he retired as a major after 20 years. My brother-in-law was in 28 years, and he came out a lieutenant colonel. And like I said, I got a grandson who's a pilot now in the Air Force, and he's a captain. But he has another year to go, and he'll probably make major because they say he's on the fast track to move up because he's pretty good. And he's been to Vietnam four times. I enjoyed flying very much. And I think you gotta like it. 
And you gotta be sort of nuts to fly like I did at night. Like I said, we never used landing lights for takeoff or landing. Just aimed a couple of flare pots and take off in black. Well, she went back. She went back into Michigan Man, who, who is it? with my brother, who was nine years younger, and uh, she, her mother was there, so she sort of looked after her mother. But she didn't like the idea that we were both in the service at the same time. Fortunately, we both got back. But you never know. We never took a lot of land. Uh, we, we would set up a base. We'd neutralize the area, you know, with our own planes. And then we'd move up again and do the same thing. And sometimes the Japanese, where we were, would move back in, you know, like from the mainland to the islands or something. We, we got to know the CBs pretty good. That's the construction battalion of the Navy because they would be coming in to make our strips for us that we use for landing and takeoffs. And they were great guys. Of course, they were coming from other islands and different areas. Of course, they controlled the whole Pacific at one time. And we were just moving along. Other people were going along in the central part. I'll tell you, I sure was glad the Navy was out there because <laughs> I'd hate to be sitting on an island and have them come in and take us over. So the Navy did a good job. The atomic bomb dropped when I hit San Francisco. So I went home on a 30-day on a leave and shortly there the war was over. And I went down to San Antonio, Texas, and I got out. But I was in the reserves, and so during the Korean War, I was called back for two years. I, uh, I had just built a new air, I mean a new house, and I had new carpeting in it. Uh, it only been in for two weeks when I had to go back. And we had two kids, so my wife had to settle the uh, place and rent it. And then I, I went down to uh, Langley. Then I went to Panama City, Florida at, at Tyndall. Well, there were so many of us that were called back at Tyndall that they didn't have room that, to uh, get us all current again in flying of the modern airplanes. So they sent me over to Keesler at Biloxi, Mississippi. So when I got over there, they said, well, what sort of a ground job did you have in the Air Force? I said, I didn't have one. I said, I was an instrument instructor and I was a flyer, flying officer. So they said, well, what'd you do in civilian life? I said, well, I was connected with some trucking and so forth. He said, we'll send you to the commercial transportation office. So I, I went down there and there was a Major Hess who was a transportation officer so they made me the assistant. Well, this was at Bluxy, Mississippi, and as you know, it gets pretty hot down there in the, in the uh, summer. You could take your shirt off almost in the morning early and wring it out from perspiration. So I had a chance to go to Lowry Air Force Base in Denver to go to transportation school. And so I did, my wife and two kids, we went out there and I got qualified as commercial transportation officer, motor pool officer, and air freight officer. So then when I went back to Keesler after school, they had moved the major out to training command headquarters at Scott Air Force Base. And so guess who's the transportation officer? I am. So anyhow, um, I still got to fly but it was more or less flying training some of the people in the radar school. And so uh, I handled all the freight and passengers in and off the base. 
And we used to handle all the van shipments for the lower part of Mississippi, people going overseas. So we had packing and crating that we'd have to pack their goods and that for shipping them overseas. And that would be different branches. And we used to handle over 100 uh, van shipments a month. So naturally the van companies were very interested in our business. And so were the airlines. They'd come in and see us. And then, of course, we had our own little locomotive. I had a 45-ton diesel electric that was assigned to me, and I had a couple of warehouses. It was some, I think I had 28 airmen yeah, working for me in the air. And then I had it in, in the main transportation office. Most of them were civil service. So I had a transportation agent and so forth. And it's a good thing I had them because they knew what they were talking about. And so I was there for two years. And I really, some of the guys went back in the bombers, some went in the all-weather fighters. We went every direction. But that's, that's what I ended up as a commercial transportation officer at Keesler, Blixey, Mississippi. Uh, when, when they bombed Pearl Harbor, I wanted to go, I wanted to be a flyboy like my dad was. And so what I did, I went down to a federal building in Detroit to sign up for the uh, Army Air Corps. And I didn't know that, but my brother reminded me that my dad was still in the States at that time. And he had to sign for me because I wasn't 21. <laughs> and so then I got in that and I had to wait till they sent me out to California by train. And I was at Santa Ana, then Oxnard for primary. And I mean, and then I went to basic at Bakersfield and then advance up at Stockton. And then I was up at Sacramento flying 25. So I got to see a lot of California. And of course, I got to see Arizona and Florida. Back in those days, nobody had any money. It's too bad I didn't have some money to buy an old orange grove in Orlando there. Of course, Phoenix wasn't, was, wasn't very big at that time either. Well, I, I, I felt good that I could serve my country. I really did. And I think everybody did. Back in those days, everybody went in to uh, the war effort, whether they were working in factories or whatever they were doing. I know there were a lot of shortages for the civilians back home. They didn't have the nylons and they didn't have the sugar or different things, or the shoes and different things like that. But I felt that I was glad to do my part for this country, and this is a great country. Um, and I, I'll, I'll always feel that way about it. And I'm glad that a lot, of, a lot of the young fellas were able to go in the military. They were glad to go in the military uh, because, you know, we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. And incidentally, some of the fellas that were at Pearl Harbor during the, the attack, they were at Hickam and, and Wheeler Field they, there were a number of sergeants that were over there. There were staff and tech sergeants and that. They came back and they went, they went into a pilot training. And some of them went through with me. And uh, in fact, a few of them ended up night fighters with me. But uh, they, they, uh, they were there when the, when the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. I used to go to all the reunions. Uh, we'd have the squadron reunion, and then the next year we'd have all the night fighters get together. And when we started, we had over 200 fellows that would show up the reunions. And then what happened, they kept dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. And then finally, we had to stop it because there weren't hardly anybody that could go. And that's what they said. <laughs> there aren't that many left. Uh, so many are dying off every day. But those reunions were great. We had a lot of fun talking about our experiences. 
He had to talk with the night fighter pilots that were over in Europe, in Africa, and so forth. And uh, it, we had a lot of close comradeship. <laughs> when that professor said to us at first uh, 8 o'clock uh, 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 time after Pearl Harbor, he had a bunch of us up there, and he said, boy, are your lives going to change. And he couldn't, he couldn't send any more truer words. And it's, it, we, were on, we were on a quarter there. We were on half years at college. So after my quarter, that's when I went down and joined. And later on, I, I, I probably would have had to sign up for the draft. But I really wanted to get into flying, and I'm glad I did. I'll tell you one thing, going through flying school, there's no picnic. You, uh, I know that when we were at, uh, at primary training, you know, you, they come in and you have to drop a coin on a bed and you have to bounce. You couldn't have any drips coming out of the faucet. We'd have to take toilet paper to get the drips out of there because if you not, didn't, you'd get gigged. And that means you then spend another hour walking around back and forth. And they, I'll tell you, there, there were a lot of guys that went and started out, but there were a lot of washouts. The, the washing machine, they called it, they, a lot of them didn't make it. So I was fortunate I made it. And when I was in basic training, uh, we always moved up to different airplanes. And I was at Bakersfield, and... I got a cold, and I was having a hard time uh, remembering all the new things in this airplane and also getting rid of my cold. So the instructor left me off for a couple days, and I worked on remembering everything and, and working on this cold, getting rid of it. And uh, <coughs> then I went back to the flight line, and he had been shooting uh, landings with a couple of other guys that he was teaching. And he said to me, we're going to go up and do some air work. Well, you go up and you do stalls and so forth. And so uh, anyhow, I did everything right. I was feeling better. And so he said, well, let's go down and shoot some landings. I said, great. Well, after, after I got out of basic training, the instructor and uh, several of us went out for drinks and dinner. And when I, we were riding back, I said, you probably were going to wash me out, weren't you? He said, I sure was. And I said, well, I'm glad that I got through it. So I know that some people get washed out. It's unfortunate that that could happen to anybody. But I'll tell you, I just couldn't get washed out. I, 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 I wouldn't let it happen. So I'm glad I got through that, and then I never had any trouble later. But uh, I'll tell you, and then at Santa Ana, when we first got there, <laughs> he'd be out there doing all the calisthenics and, and all the runs and everything he had to do. And uh, I know that we'd, we'd come back, say, on a Sunday, having had a pass to go to town, and you'd be at attention in this hot sun. And different guys would fall over. Well, you couldn't stop and pick them up. You had to stay right there. And uh, the, the uh, one thing, they really gave it to us to make sure we could take it. Because, you know, you're flying expensive airplanes, and they just want to turn a whole bunch of guys loose. So they had to make sure that you could really take it. And they gave it to us. But I'm glad I got through it.
and the turrets up on the top. Oh, big well, yeah, that's why I needed two good sized engines. Mm -hmm. It had the Pratt and, Pratt and Whitney R2800s. It's the same size engine that a P47 had, the jug. Oh, really? And so, but when, all, when you consider all the ammunition we carried and the heavy radar and everything else, we needed that. But, but it was very flexible. Your bombs weren't balanced under the wing one on the head. We didn't two. carry bombs at first. Uh, later on, they added yeah. that. They also carried na napalms yeah. okay. underneath the wings. Of course, that just burns the heck out of the air and everything. One of those napalms on oh. the ground blocked out. Why didn't you have three on each side? Why only two? What you mean, the guns? Uh, gun. No, 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 bombs. Oh, well, we didn't carry bombs at first. They added those later on uh, uh, under the wings. Uh, <clears throat> what, what was your rank when you... Well, I was put in for first lieutenant as an instrument instructor, and then when they moved us from... Uh, from